part one on one with Mr. Berger. Welcome to another episode of Art One on One. I'm Nicole Jordan alongside Mr. Berger, your professional artist and master educator. How are we doing? Wonderful. I'll tell you what, this summer is going to be the end of me. <laughs> yeah, that was sarcasm. I if have. You, if you couldn't tell. I have. I'm about what? Uh, uh, maybe days into summer? Just not even a week? Yeah, no. Days into summer. And it's kids, it's classes, it's college, um, getting things ready for next year for teaching some college uh, courses. It's, you know, trying to navigate, getting my room ready, trying to get things going, to finishing up a yearbook. Yeah, a lot going on. Oh, dealing with kids at the end of the year. Dealing with kids at the end of the year. Your kids, my kids, <laughs> our kids, their kids. <laughs> We need a vacation. We need a vacation from summer. Actually, we did just go to Kansas City, though. We did. To the art museum there. In the not-too-distant future, if you're a a loyal follower, you'll get some some Kansas City clippets. That's good Content. We built some content. That was good. All right. Well, we're going to get to it because, as we said, life has been busy and... Yeah. And because we've got so many things, just to preface... We're going pretty mainstream, bare bones. We're not doing a whole lot of edits. We're not doing a whole lot of trigonometry with the this and the that and all of those things. We're just kind of putting together the podcast. We're winging it today. On, on, on the fly because, yeah, lots of things going on. So, But it's important. But it is. It is. It is. And we're excited about it. We look forward to doing this. We do. Yeah. I look forward to it. Yeah, I do too. It's like our uh, it's like our quality time. <laughs> yes. Although he was giving me a lecture before this, so. Well, I think that it's important for things to you know to go a certain flow a certain way. Yes, but I am the pod boss, and I am in charge of the flow. Okay, then. Clearly, you thought you were. In then let's of the start flow. flowing there. All right, all right. First video. Yes. Most stolen piece of art in history. The Ghent altarpiece. Um, lots of interesting things about this particular work. Uh, every, you know, from Napoleon to Hitler, you've got people trying to get it into their collection. And, uh, it's just, it's one of those pieces that's iconic. Um, and I don't, I don't understand why. And there, there are, I mean, it's, it's, um, one of the first major paintings oil paintings that was done on that scale for an altarpiece that embodies a lot of the Christian symbols into it. So you have basically every, it's hard to say every, but nearly every major symbol from Mary and the the conception all the way to the crucifixion of of Jesus, so it's I mean, so in, in terms of Christian um, Jesus sort of symbols, it's I mean, you're not going to find a work that's going to have more stuff embedded into it than the Ghent altarpiece. Uh, the uh, Van Eyck brothers painted this, and they went to heavy lengths to put everything in there. Highly skilled. Artists that I mean, they were using very fine brushes. I mean, fine meaning a single hair used to put the details in. I mean, absolute precision. Um, you know, kind of bordering on the Gothic and the Renaissance. You like that Gothic stuff when mm-hmm, we were in Kansas I City. Did, yeah. You seem to really enjoy that. But again, it had a little bit more of that realistic flair of the Renaissance. And there are lots of things that were in there that, um, in the painting, that really uh, shaped and reshaped um, collectors and artists and how, how things were, were moving and flowing. And like I said, Hitler, who 
very much enjoyed art. I, I wouldn't call him an art lover from the standpoint that there was only one specific type of art that he liked, that very highly detailed, realistic, straightforward art like you see here in this example. Um, he didn't like Van Gogh. He didn't. He, he made a whole exhibition, the Degenerate Art Show, where he ridiculed um, artists. He, he talked, Bain is a, um, is a kind of a, Nazi sort of propaganda piece. I mean, he he what he was in an insane asylum, and we'll talk about this more as we go. But um, just because you're in, in an insane asylum doesn't necessarily mean you're insane, and we'll talk more about that as we go. <laughs> okay, so where was the first place this was exhibited? Well, it was uh, in Ghent. Ghent is the name of a town, okay, and a, a city, and so it was in a church. Right. And so it would have all of the panels would have been put into a like a giant frame or a series of frames, and it would have gone in the front of the altar. Um, and so the the minister or you know yeah. the, would stand in front and give the you know the Sunday service or mass in front of the altar, and um, and so this is kind of like the backdrop. Of, of the church service. And there, a couple panels were stolen from. Is that the first place? or You know, I'm not really sure all of the pieces and parts that were stolen. I mean, I know that there's a history there yeah. of pieces being removed and added and, you know... Um, and a replica put in replicas, that never got replaced. And, and, yeah, and different things like that happening. But I don't know... I haven't done enough research on the work itself to know all of those pieces, but I do know that people died trying to save this. People died trying to steal this. People people uh, put their lives at, at jeopardy because this was such a uh, major component of what they wanted for whatever reason, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, you know, they, they put their lives on the line to obtain it or save it, and... Um, yeah, it makes me think of the, the Monuments Men movie we watched. That right. Was, I mean, that was a part of this piece, right? Or, it, absolutely, and I yeah. actually have a video on the Monuments Men if people want to go back and take a look at that content as well. Um, but yeah, there's lots and lots of stuff in there um, on, on the artists that... And, and there's a little bit of Hollywood in that, especially when it goes around the right. Ghent altarpiece. Um, but there's also a lot of, there's a vein of truth in a lot of that too. So Yeah, it's a pretty fascinating movie. Right. I thought it was. Okay, yeah. well, on to, next, on to the next video. Yeah. Which is a change of pace. So the inbred artist. Right. Uh, Toulouse-Lautrec. Henri Toulouse-Lautrec. Yes. And... You know, his grandmothers were sisters. and Which makes him inbred. It does. And he had Somehow. lots of, he had lots of issues. Um, issues that he was born with. Uh, his stature was one. Although there were things, uh, he was not neurologically uh, affected by his grandparents being, like, by him being, you know... You say this, but I, I don't... I mean, isn't that a thing, though? I mean, physically, genetically, it, doesn't it mess with your... Absolutely. So how do you know he wasn't? Because there are records of the things that he... Like, there are his writings. There are the things that he did. Mm -hmm. There are things that... Like, there are these elements of pieces that he... Uh, he he would show his intellect. He wasn't just a slobbering artist. He had issues. He was an alcoholic. He had um, syphilis. He slept with prostitutes. He ran around with thugs and really bad people. Um, but that's mostly because he was abnormally small. 
Right. He was picked on by his dad. He was made fun of by others. He was seen as a clown. The thing that he was skilled at was his art. And it was the prostitutes and the, the, the drunks and the people like that that were like, hey, come on with us. We'll accept you. And so he ran with the group that accepted him. And the, I, it, being a teacher... I can tell you there are lots and lots of good kids that run with a bad crowd, not because they're a bad kid, but because they accept him right. or her. Well, they, and in spite of all of that, he became a very popular he be, he he, he found success in going back to the Vincent Van Gogh comment. He was also put into a mental hospital, and he, but there, but there, again, you've got to look at the times. People during that time would go into a mental institution if they were an alcoholic, if they were, um, if you were a kleptomaniac, you would be put into a mental institution. If um, if you had any form of of habit or vice that was ha habitual, mm -hmm. yeah, they'd put you. Into a mental institution. If if my mom were alive, who had dementia and Alzheimer's, she would have been put into a mental institution because they say, "What's wrong with her? There's nothing wrong with her. She's act just acting like oh, she's acting weird. She's not. She didn't used to act like that, but now look how she acts." They put her in a mental institution. A, a, a woman that had a baby and had um, postpartum postpartum depression. Absolutely, they would be put into a mental hospital and and these things are documented fact these things actually happen to people and once you're in it's it's a hard son of a gun to get out um fortunately someone like vincent van gogh he was able to get out because he put himself in but if you're married to the wrong guy as a female and that guy says my wife's acting crazy she just had a baby Okay, well, we're going to lock her up. And there's the only person that can get you out is your husband that just put you in. And, yeah, you know, you're at the discretion and the trust of that person to eventually come and let you out. And there were people like Camille Claudel, who was a very great artist, uh, but ended up go having to go into a psychiatric hospital because of... Um, issues with with others that basically forced her into that uh, into that position that she just could never get out of but you can watch the video on that <laughs> as I'm self-promoting in my promotional podcast well and well self-promotion I don't know how I'm gonna shift from there but we do want to talk about uh, moose man moose man yeah our, our good friend moose man did send he sent a couple of questions, and if you have questions, fellow pod people, or Moose Man, if you have more questions, by all means, uh, but this is another question we have, uh, on a couple of occasions now, asked questions, or answered questions that have been asked. And I think you wanted to point out about Moose Man's, like, to follow Moose Man as well. Right? Correct. Because yes. We Thank you. Uh, look right up here. There is a link to Moose Man, if you're on the uh, on the YouTube, if you're following, if you're listening to this on another podcast service, obviously you can't see what I'm pointing at. So, you know, do he not need to go do not adjust the dial. Institution. <laughs> no, it's and yeah. So again, today, anyway. check out Moose. Man. He does he does artwork and and just a great guy. Go jump onto his channel and give him a follow and tell him. Hey, Mr. Berger over on Art One Hundred and One sent you over, and and you know he, he what a what a lovely character. At um, any rate, Moose Man asks: At what age did you know art was going to be your profession? And is there a particular work that resonated with you as a child? For me, it was Da Vinci's cartoon of the Madonna and Child, which I saw on a trip to the National Gallery in London when I was seven years old. As you know, I came to art much later in life, but that work still grips me today. Yes. Now, the first item that's up for bid is the, the idea of a cartoon. A lot of my listeners, followers, watchers are thinking a cartoon. 
Leonardo da Vinci made cartoons? No. Not as you think of it as a cartoon. He wasn't making comic strips cartoons. Cartoon is a, a, a sketch or a drawing that's a little bit more polished. These would be, they would start out as a small sketch and oftentimes be enlarged. These enlarged sketches would be used, they would poke holes in the sketch and they would put them up against the wall or the surface that they were going to draw on. So for example, Leonardo da Vinci uh, with the the uh, Madonna and Child. This would be a very, uh, you know, a sketch that would be done uh, before the painting was created. Um, but again, in other contexts, uh, Michelangelo Bonarotti would do these and again, poke holes into them and then use that uh, to, to press against the wall and draw on it and then creating a series of dots that he would create lines so that he could do this very enlarged um, uh, painting on ceilings and curves and all kinds of things. But at any rate, he's bringing this up because I asked him the uh, question. There, there are lots of there are lots of people that have that question though. Right. They, like they 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 see cartoon and they don't understand how how is that a cartoon? So that's so we're just laying the the groundwork, but. At what question. age did I know that art was for me? I, I really don't know. As a young kid, I never went to an art museum until I was in high school. I, I was fascinated by art, but not like, you know, not professional fine art. But I can remember the first time I saw fine art. I would have been kindergarten, had to have been, maybe first grade, but probably kindergarten. And it wasn't, it isn't where you'd expect it to be. My favorite class in elementary school was music class. Which surprises me, but kind of makes sense. And I, I loved music class. I loved singing as, as a little boy. And so... The class gets into a line, and we go down the hallway, and you, you took a right turn from that classroom. You went down to these stairs, and in this sunken room, there was this square concrete bunker of a room, and there was Mr. Patterson. Mr. Patterson always had a suit jacket on, a bow tie. He had had this long, he had, he had a long hair in the front, long bangs, and his long bangs would hang, and as he would play, he would kind of move his body around, and his hair would wafe in his face, and it was like, oh my gosh, look at him, and then it was, and he would always play like Beethoven, I, I always remember him playing Beethoven, like Moonlight Sonata, and it was just so pretty, and like, oh my gosh, like this is, this, is this heaven? It's your, you were in your element. It was, it was my, it was my place, and on his, he had this bulletin board on the wall, and on the bulletin board was a poster of the old guitarist, which was from Pablo Picasso's Blue Period, which you could find at the Chicago Art Institute, at any rate. So there's Mr. Patterson with his bow tie and his hair and the, Mozart, uh, the, the, the Beethoven music, not Mozart, the Beethoven music is flowing, and there's the poster, and all of those things just kind of fuse. And it's like, I like this, I like that, I like this, I like uh, It was just, like, yes, this all made sense to me. And so seeing the old guitarist and, and appreciating that and, and experiencing that made me think, wow, like, this is so arty, you know, like the, the fine arts, and um, that was the first time that a, that a, a what would be called a fine art piece really gripped me in a, in a certain in a certain sort of way, um, and and it was at that ripe age of five <laughs> that it happened, and um, you know, and, and again, instantly, if I see the old guitars, regardless of my 
opinions of Picasso, who was an absolute prick. He was a womanizer. He was a misogynist. He was a, as a person, he was not a good person. But there's a piece of me that has no choice but to love Picasso because of that painting. So, anyway, there's, there's that. And uh, hopefully that answers Moose Man's question. And if anybody has other questions, as I said, make the make the comments down below or or uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah any it, feedback? Any yeah. any things you want us to to it, cover? Regardless of where you're listening to this podcast or watching the content, you know, drop me a line. Uh, Super easy to find all over social media. Shoot me a question. If you have a question for the podcast, you can find me on the TikTok or the flip flop or the. And the TikTok he's been doing his, his art. My art videos. I've been uh, cranking this week um, with the start of summer. I was going to wait till June the 1st, but I thought, you know what? You're no right time like it. the present. Let's. I'm not going to. You're kind of like that. You make a decision and then you're I, just, you're going to do it. You know, it's kind of how you found yourself in this podcast. I, I made a decision that you were in. It is true. And regardless of how much you whine and complain and kick and cry, that do it yourself, then. You're in, lady. You're in. That's true. All right. So let's finish out here. Okay. Let's, with your last video. The last one was the... Second Impressionist Art ex yeah. Yeah. Second Impressionist Art Exhibition. Correct. And I would say that the major piece of that um, that I hope to really drive home is that, I mean, you're, you're talking about a, a show of small numbers. You're, you're talking about 20 people in this particular show. And which is, you know, small numbers for any exhibition. You know, you got 20 people. Usually, I mean, most exhibitions... Uh, you know, you're going to have a few more than that, but uh, give or take. I mean, you can have smaller ones, you can have bigger ones. But the point is that Gustav Kalabut put the financial backing behind this, and had he not decided that he was going to financially back this, it would have gone away. You had very well-to-do type people like Degas, who was a bit of an outsider coming in. He was not an impressionist. He was a right. he was a realist, and he painted like a realist. And Calabut had his style was a little bit more crisp and a little bit more sharp than an impressionist. But without his financial backing, the impressionists would have. They, yeah, because their first one was a flop. The first exhibition. The first show was a flop. The second show, he put the money behind it to push it. And in this show, they were not yet known as the Impressionists. That that was a name that was given to them, like th that slight was already given. They were kicking around the idea of being called the Impressionists, but it would not be until 1877, the next show after this, that they would start to say, you know what, let's call ourselves the Impressionists. Let's call this the Impressionist uh, Exhibition. And so, had it not been for Calibut, there may not have ever been a group known as the Impressionists. They would have maybe been given a different name by other generations. Uh, history could have been very, very different had he not gotten involved. Well, that and name came because from people not... People didn't like them. They, they, they criticized get, them. Right. They, and that, the name came during the first exhibition... But they wouldn't, obviously, they couldn't use it in the first one. They didn't use it in the second one. And again, it wouldn't be until 1877, uh, years after the original comment was made, that they would use the, use the disrespectful slight as a, all right, we're impressionists now. We're doing impressions. And, um, you know. It, it is what it is. And we'll be talking about those next exhibitions. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, the, it's a whole series. So every month from now until the end of the year, we'll have the 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th. 
uh, as we go through the months and uh, you know stay tuned for that and uh, I did have one question on the exhibition like how long so they put the art out how long was it out there a month. before okay a month All right. yeah they would they so they had the they had the exhibition space for a month so they would they would bring it all in they would set up the show and then it was up for a month and then they would take it down um, I believe that this show was like April 1st through the 30th so I mean so yeah no matter how you sliced it it's a month but I, I believe this show was was you know almost exactly a month um, from the 1st to the 30th and no critics like it was more like because because before with the salons it was all critics that got to judge who came in and or who got what do I want to say their art was put in that exhibition or the salon right and the, now that, there were that judges the right there judges. were there were judges that would say this gets in this is accepted and this is out it was very uh, exclusive in that way where this was um, all of the artists paid to be in the show so if we were artists we would say okay we're pooling our money so we can rent the space so we can do the thing so we're pooling our money to get in and this show unlike the first show unlike their after the first show they had a they tried an auction which was a complete flop as well but this is the first time that they actually all made money on people coming to look at the artwork it the critics didn't love it the people didn't love it it wasn't like oh my gosh this is the best ever take our money but they turned some profit it was minimal it was razor thin but they they made money uh, as a group um, and with Calibut and with that financial backing to help because they didn't have yeah. a lot of times they, they didn't have the, the uh, again all of the the finances to make everything happen out of their pocket so him having that investment of saying okay let's let's put this together uh, really made it happen and Degas who hated Calibut because he saw him as kind of taking his Taking, taking his thunder, exactly. <laughs> and so he was like, get this rich snob out of here, where Degas was kind of the the rich snob, you know. And I think time has not been very good to certain artists, including Degas. Uh, Degas is kind of a, he was known for saying some very anti-Semitic sorts of comments. He, he uh, very much ridiculed his fellow artist and impressionist, um, uh, Pizarro, Camilo Pizarro, because of his uh, Jewish background and things like that, and so uh, ancestry. Um, so he he was very much critical, and, and he burnt a lot of bridges. Especially, I mean, at this point, he was not completely a bigot, but as he got older, he got more and more. Um, disconnected with the type of um, decency that he had in his youth. And did Gustav, did he stay connected? Like the next exhibition, just, I mean, I know he, we're going to cover that, but out of curiosity. Uh, yes, he did. Yeah. Okay. He did. He would stay, he would stay involved until, uh, until his demise. So stay tuned for that. Speaking of demise, we need to, Close yeah, we get, we got to get podcast. close to the end here. And, it's getting late uh, here. And well, not only that, but we've got lots and lots of things going on, and you know, these the podcasts and the thing. It takes time. You got to edit this and that, and put shuffle it all together. And and time is uh, limited, and so yeah, we'll we'll just call it here. And uh, I very much appreciate everybody for following us on. TikTok, YouTube, um, Spotify, Instagram, you know, wherever social media happens, search for Mr. Burger in one way, shape, or form, and you will find me in, in some facet. Even if it's on the great social media of uh, Fortnite, oh, you can even find Don't me there. Me started on Fortnite. All right, well, everybody, thanks for joining us. 
we will see you next time. Yeah, we'll see ya.